Chapter One of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One Twilight in the Park. You may wait, Renon. The voice was firm but the lady herself hesitated as she stepped from the tonneau there was no answer holding the flapping ends of her veil away from her face she turned and looked fairly at the driver of the machine he seemed a business-like capable man though certain minor details of his chauffeur's rig were a bit unusual and now that he had been obliged by some discomfort to remove his goggles his face appeared pleasant and quite untanned his passenger noted these things, remarking, Oh, it isn't Renault. No, mademoiselle. Renault hadn't showed up at the office when you telephoned, so they put me on in his place. Ah, I see. Accent seemed to imply, however, that she was not quite pleased. The manager sent you, and your name is? My name, a rather odd name, Hand. The face, half hidden behind the veil, remained impassive a moment's hesitation and then the lady turned away with a short you will wait as mademoiselle wishes or shall i perhaps follow slowly along the drive no wait here i shall return soon the young woman walked away erect well poised lifting skirts skilfully as she paused a moment at the top of the stone steps leading down into the tiny park the driver of the machine free from observation allowed a perplexed look to occupy his countenance what the devil is to pay if she doesn't return soon the avenue lifts a camel's hump toward the sky in the space of fifteen blocks and on the top secure as the howdah of a chieftain stands the noble portico of the old college to the westward as every one knows lie the river and the more pretentious park on the east an abrupt descent offers space for a small grassy playground for children who may be seen during the sunny hours of the day romping over the slope as the gaze of the woman swept over the charming little pleasance and beyond over the miles of signboards roofs chimneys and intersecting streets the serious look disappeared from her face summer haze and distance shed a gentle beauty over what she knew to be a clamoring city new york angles were softened noises subdued sensational scenes lost in the dimmed perspective to a chance observer the prospect would have been deeply suggestive in the woman it stirred many memories she put back her veil her face glowed a long sigh escaped her lips slowly she walked down the steps along the sloping path to a turn where she sank down on a bench a rosy tired child rather the worse for mud pies and hanging reluctantly at the hand of its nonchalant nurse brought a bit of the woman's emotion to the surface she smiled radiantly at the lagging infant the face revealed by the uplifted veil was of a type to accompany the youthful but womanly figure and the spirited tread beautiful she would be counted without doubt by many an observer those who loved her would call her beautiful without stint but more appealing than her beauty was the fine spirit a strong free spirit loving honesty and courage which glowed like a flame behind her beauty best of all perhaps was a touch of quaintness a slightly comic twist to her lips an imperceptible alertness of manner which revealed to the initiated that she had a sense of humour in excellent running order it was evident that the little excursion was of the nature of a pilgrimage the idle hour the bit of holiday became a memorial as recollection brought back to her the days of childhood spent down yonder a few squares away in this very city they seemed bright in retrospect like the pleasant pass of a quiet garden but they had ended abruptly and had been followed by years of activity and colorful experience in another country through it all 
what anticipations had been lodged in her return to home something there would complete the story the story with its secret ecstasies and aspirations the story of the ardent springs of youth withdrawing her gaze from the scene below though with apparent reluctance she took from the pocket of her coat an opened envelope which she regarded a moment with thoughtfulness before drawing forth the enclosures there were two letters one of which was brief and written in bad script on a single sheet of paper bearing a legal head it was dated at charlesport maine and stated that the writer in conformity with the last wish of his friend and client hercules thayer was ready to transfer certain deeds and papers to the late mr thayer's designated heir agatha redmond also that the writer requested an interview at miss redmond's earliest convenience holding the half-open sheets in her hand the lady closed her eyes and sat motionless as if in the grasp of an absorbing thought with the disappearing child the signs of life on the hillside had diminished the traffic of the street passed far below the sharp click-click of a pedestrian now and then sounded above but no one passed her way the hum of the city made a blurred wash of sound like the varying yet steady wash of the sea as she opened her eyes again she saw that the twilight had perceptibly deepened far away lights began to flash out in the city as if a million fireflies by twos and threes and dozens were waking to their nocturnal revelry on the hill the light was still good and the lady turned again to her reading the other letter was written on single sheets of thin paper in an old-fashioned beautiful hand wherever a double s occurred the first was written long in the style of sixty years ago and the whole letter was as easily legible as print across the top was written to agatha redmond daughter of my ward and dear friend agatha shaw redmond and below that in the lawyer's choppy handwriting was a date of nearly a year previous as agatha redmond read the second letter a smile half of sadness half of pleasure overspread her countenance it ran as follows Ilion, maine my dear agatha i take my pen in hand to address you the daughter of the dearest friend of my life for the first time in the twenty-odd years of your existence once as a child you saw me and you have doubtless heard my name from your mother's people from time to time but i can scarcely hope that any knowledge of my private life has come to you it will be easy then for you to pardon an old man for giving you in this fashion the confidence he has never been able to bestow in the flesh when you read this epistle my dear agatha i shall have stepped into that next mystery which is death indeed the duty which i am now discharging serves as partial preparation for that very event this duty is to make you heir to my house and estate and to certain accessory funds which will enable you to keep up the place you may regard this act possibly as the idiosyncrasy of an unbalanced mind it is certain that some of my kinsfolk will do so but while i have been able to bear up under their greater or less displeasure for many years i find myself shrinking before the possibility of dying absolutely unknown and forgotten by you your mother agatha shaw of blessed memory now for many years was my ward and pupil after the death of your grandfather i think i may say without undue self-congratulation that few women of their time have enjoyed as sound a scheme of education as your mother she had a knowledge of mathematics could construe both in latin and greek and had acquired a fair mastery of the historic civilization of the greeks egyptians and ancient babylonians while these attainments would naturally be insufficient for a man's work in life yet for a woman they were of an exceptional order sufficient to say that in your mother's character these noteworthy abilities were supplemented by gracious womanly arts and when she arrived at maturity i offered her the honour of marriage it is painful for me to recall the scene and the consequences of your mother's refusal of my hand even after these years of philosophical reflection 
it were idle for a man of parts to allow a mere preference in regard to his domestic situation to influence his course of action in any essential matter and i have never permitted my career to be shaped by such details but from that time however the course of my life was changed from the impassioned orator and preacher i was transformed into the man of books and the study and since then i have lived far from the larger concourses of men my weekly sermon for twenty years has been the essence of my weekly toil in establishing the authenticity first of the entire second gospel and second of the ten doubtful verses in the fifteenth chapter my work is now accomplished for all time i believe from the inception of what i considered my life mission i made the resolve to bequeath to agatha shaw whatever manuscripts or other material of value my work should lead me to accumulate together with this house in which i have spent all the later years of my life you are agatha shaw's only child therefore to me a foster child another reason four years ago led me to confirm my former testament from time to time i have informed myself concerning your movements and fortunes the work you have chosen my dear agatha i can but believe to be fraught with unusual dangers to a young woman therefore i hope that this home modest as it is may tempt you to an early retirement from the stage and lead you to a more private and womanly career this i make only as a request not as a condition i bid you farewell and give you my blessing faithfully yours hercules thayer agatha redmond folded the thin sheets carefully there was a mist in her gaze as she looked off toward the distant city lights dear old gentleman his whole love story and my mother's too perhaps her quickened memory recalled childish impressions of a visit to a large country house and of a solemn old man he seemed incredibly ancient to her and of feeling that in some way she and her mother were in a special relationship to the house it was called the old red house and was full of fascinating things the ancient man had bidden her go about and play as if it were her home and then had called her to him and laid open a book leading her mind to regard its mysteries greek it seemed to her as if she had begun it there and then later the mother became the teacher she was nursed as it were within sight of the windy plains of troy and to the sound of the homeric hymns and all by reason of this ancient scholar there was a vivid picture in her mind gathered at some later visit of a soft hillside a small white church standing under its balm of gilead tree and herself sitting by a stone in the old churchyard listening to the strains of a hymn which floated out from the high narrow windows she remembered how from without she had joined in the hymn singing with all her small might and suddenly the association brought back to her a more recent event and a more beautiful strain of music half in reverie half in conscious pleasure in the exercise of a facile organ she began to sing free of my pain free of my burden of sorrow at last i shall see thee the song floated in a zone of silence that lay above the deep murmuring city the voice was no more than the half-voice of a flute sweet gentle beguiling it told as so many songs tell of little earthly love in the grasp of mighty fate still she sang on softly as if loving the entrancing melody suddenly the song ceased and the reminiscent smile gave place to an expression of surprise as the singer became conscious of a deeper shadow falling directly in front of her she glanced up quickly and found herself looking into the face of a man whose gimlet-like gaze was directed upon herself quickly as she rose she could not turn into the path before the gentleman hat in hand with a deep bow and clearly enunciated words arrested her impulse to flight pardon mademoiselle i am a stranger in the city i was directed this way to van cortland hall but i find i am in error intrigued in confusion would mademoiselle be so good as to direct me 
the tones had a foreign accent there was something also in their bland impertinence which put miss redmond on her guard he was a good-sized blond person carefully dressed and at least appeared like a gentleman miss redmond looked into the smooth neat countenance upon which no record either of experience or of thought was engraved and decided fleetingly that he was lying she judged him capable of picking up acquaintances on the street but thought that more originality might be expected of him suddenly she wished that she had returned sooner to her car for though she was of an adventurous nature her bravery was not of the physical order and she disliked to have the appearance of unconventionality after the first minute she was not so much afraid as annoyed her voice became frigid though her dignity was somewhat damaged by the fact that she bungled in giving the desired information i think monsieur will find van cortlandt hall in the college grounds two blocks south no north of the gateway yonder at the upper end of this walk ah mademoiselle is but too kind he bowed deeply again hat still in hand i thank you profoundly and may i say also that this wonderful picture here he spread eloquent hands toward the half quiescent city whose thousand eyes glimmered over the lower distance this panorama of occidental life makes a peculiar appeal to the imagination the springs of emotion touched potently as they had been by the surging recollections of the last half hour were faintly stirred again in miss redmond's heart by the stranger's grandiloquent words unconsciously her features relaxed though she did not reply again i pray mademoiselle to pardon me but only a moment past i heard the song the song that might be the sigh of all the daughters of italy ah mademoiselle it is wonderful but here in this so fresh country this youthful boisterous too prosperous country that song is like 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 arabian spices in a kitchen is it not so miss redmond was moving up the steps toward the entrance hesitating between the desire to snub her interlocutor and to avoid the appearance of fright the man meanwhile moved easily beside her courteously distant discourteously insistent in his prattle but the motor-car was now not far away the stranger looked appealingly at her seemingly sure of a humorous answering look to his pleasantry it was not wholly denied she yielded to a touch of amusement with a cool smile and hastened her steps the man kept pace without effort luckily the car stood only a few feet away with renault or rather hand at the curb holding open the door a vague bow and a lifting of the hat and apparently the stranger went the other way she felt a foolish relief and at that same instant noted with surprise that the cover of her car had been raised why did you raise the top it appeared to me mademoiselle that it was likely to rain put it down again it will not rain miss redmond was saying when from sidelong eyes she saw that the stranger had not turned in the other direction after all but was almost in her tracks as though he were stalking game with foot on the step she said sharply but in a low voice to the plaza quickly then immediately added with a characteristic practical turn but don't get yourself arrested for speeding no mademoiselle with this car i can make even as the chauffeur replied miss redmond's sharpened senses detected a passage of glances between him and the stranger now close behind her she sprang into the tonneau and seized the door but not before the man had caught at it with a stronger hold and stepped in close after her the chauffeur was in his seat the car was moving slowly now faster and faster suddenly the bland countenance slid very near her own while firm hands against her shoulders crowded her into the farther corner of the tonneau oh renault hand she cried but the driver made no sign help help she shrieked but the cry was instantly choked into a feeble protest a mass of something pressed to her mouth and nostrils incited her to superhuman efforts she struggled frantically fumbled at the door tore at the curtain and succeeded in getting her head 
for an instant at the opening while she clutched her assailant and held him helpless but only for a moment the firm large hands quickly overpowered even the strength induced by frenzy and in another minute she was lying unresisting on the soft cushions of the tonneau the car careened through the streets the figure of the unresponsive hand mocked her cries for help the neat hard face of the stranger continued to bend over her then everything swam in a maelstrom of duller and duller sense the world grew darker and fainter till finally it was lost in silence End of chapter one Chapter Two of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Two Hamilton of Lynn. The Hamiltons of Lynn had not distinguished themselves, in late generations at least, by remarkable deeds, though their deportment was such as to imply that they could if they would they frankly regarded themselves as the elect of the earth if not of heaven always however with a becoming modesty since sixteen thirty six the family had pieced out its existence in the new world tenaciously clinging to many of its old country habits it had kept the b in the family name for instance it had kept the name itself out of trade and it had indulged its love of country life at the expense of more than one hamilton fortune a daughter-in-law was once reported as saying that it would have been a good thing if some hamilton had embarked in trade since in that case they might have been saved from devoting themselves exclusively to an illustration of polite poverty she was never forgiven and died without being reconciled to the family as to the spelling of the name the family claimed ancestral authority as far back as king fergus the first mrs van camp a relative by marriage a woman considered by the best hamiltons as far too frank and worldly-minded informed the family that king fergus was as much a myth as dido and innocently brought forth printed facts to corroborate her statement one of the ladies hambleton crushed mrs van camp by stating in a tone of deep personal conviction with her cap awry so much the worse for dido a salient strength persisted in the hambletons a strength which retained its character in spite of cross currents the hambleton tone and the hambleton ideas retained their family colour and became whether worthily or not a part of the hamilton pride more than one son had lost his health or entire fortune which was apt not to be large in attempts to carry on a country place a hamilton trait they chuckled with as much satisfaction as they considered it good form to exhibit in lynn where family pride did not bring in large returns this phrase became almost synonymous with genteel foolishness the van camp fortune which came near but never actually into the family was generally understood to have been made in shoes though in reality it was drugs people say shoes the minute they hear the word lynn and i'm tired of explaining mrs van camp put it she was third in line from the successful druggist and could afford if anybody could to be supercilious toward trade but she wasn't even after twenty years of somewhat restless submission to the hambleton yoke and it was she who during her last visit to the family stronghold held up before the young james the advantages of a commercial career you're a nice boy jimsy and i can't see you turned into a poor lawyer you're not hard-hearted enough to be a good one as for being a minister well no go into business dear boy something substantial and you'll live to thank your stars jimsy received this advice at the time with small enthusiasm and a reservation of criticism that was a credit to his manners at least but the time came when he leaned on it her own child however mrs van camp encouraged to a profession from the first aleck isn't smart enough for business but he may do something as a student 
was mrs van camp's somewhat trying explanation and aleck did do something as a student extremely impatient with any exhibition of laziness the mother demanded a good accounting of her son's time aleck and jim who were born in the same year ran more or less side by side until the end of college they struggled together in sports and in arguments rushed the same girl in turn or simultaneously and spent their long vacations cruising up and down the main coast in a thirty-foot sailboat once they made a more ambitious journey all the way to yarmouth and the bay of fundy in a good-sized fishing smack but when college was done their ways separated mrs van camp in the prime of her unusual faculties died having decorated the hambleton scutcheon like a gay cockade stuck airily up into the breeze she had no part nor lot in the family pride but understood it perhaps better than the hambletons themselves her crime was that she played with it aleck a full-fledged biologist went to the little hebrides to work out his fresh and solid theory concerning the nerve system of the clam james third son of john and edith hambleton of lynn had his eyes thoroughly opened in the three months after commencement by a consideration of the family situation it seemed to him that from babyhood he had been burningly conscious of the pinching and skimping necessary to maintain the family pride the two older brothers were exempt from the scorching process the eldest being the family darling and the second a genius neither one could rationally be expected just at present to take up the family accounts and make the income square up with even a decently generous outgo and there were the girls yet to be educated jim had no special talent to bless himself with either in art or science he was inordinately fond of the sea but that did not help him in choosing a career he had good taste in books and some little skill in music he was indeed thrall to the human voice especially to the low voice in woman and he was that best of all critics a good listener his greatest riches as well as his greatest charm lay in a spirit of invincible youth but he was no genius no one perceived that more clearly than himself so he remembered clara van camp's advice wrote the whole story to aleck and cast about for the one successful business chance in the four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine bad ones as the statistics have it he actually found it in shoes football muscle and grit went into the job of putting a superior shoe on an inferior foot if necessary at least on some foot he got a chance to try his powers in the home branch of a manufacturing house and made good when he came to fill a position where there was opportunity to try new ideas he tried them he inspected tanneries and stockyards he got composite measurements of all the feet in all the women's colleges in the year ninety seven he drilled salesmen and opened a night school for the buttonhole makers he made a scientific study of heels and he invented an aristocratic arch and put it on the market the family joked about his doings as the harmless experiments of a lively boy but presently they began to enjoy his income through it all they were affectionate and kind with the matter-of-course fondness which a family gives to the member that takes the part of useful drudge john the pet of the parents married and had his own eyes opened it is to be supposed donald the genius had just arrived after a dozen years or so at the stage where he was mentioned now and then in the literary journals but jim stuck to shoes and kept the family on a fair tide of modest prosperity once in the years of jim's apprenticeship to life there came over him a fit of soul sickness that nearly proved his ruin i can't stand this he wrote aleck van camp it's too hard and dry and sordid for any man that's got a soul it isn't the grind i mind though that is bad enough it is the commercial idea that eats into a man's innards he forgets there are things that money can't buy and in his heart he grows contemptuous of anything to be had without money and without price he can't help it if he is thinking of trade nine-tenths of the time his mind gets set 
that way i'm ready any minute to jump the fence like father's old colt up on the farm i'm not a snob but i recognize now that there was some reason for all our old hambleton ancestors being so finicky about trade do you remember how we used to talk when we were kiddies about keeping our ideals well i believe i'm bankrupt aleck in my account with ideals i don't want to howl and these remarks don't go with anybody else but i can say to you i want them back again aleck did as a kitty should do writing much advice on long sheets of paper and illustrating his points richly like a good scotchman with scientific instances a month or two later he contrived to have work to do in boston so that he could go out to lynn and look up jimmy's case he even devised a cure by creating in his mind an office in the biological world which was to be offered to james on the ground that science needed just his abilities and training but when aleck arrived in lynn he found that jim in some fashion or other had found a cure for himself he was deeper than ever in the business and yet in some spiritual sense he had found himself he had captured his ideal again and yoked it to duty which is a great feat after twelve years of ferocious labor with no vacations to speak of james's mind took a turn for the worse physically he was as sound as a bell though of a laugh-like thinness but an upper vessel in his blood lured his mind away from the study of lasts and accounts and parisian models and sent it careering like satan up and down the earth romance which had been drugged during the transition from youth to manhood awoke and coaxed for its rights and whispered temptingly in an ear not yet dull to its voice freedom open spaces laughter the fresh sweep of the wind the high buccaneering piracy of life and joy these things beglamoured his senses so one day he locked his desk with a final click the business was in good shape it is but justice to say that if it had not been romance had dangled her luring wisp of light in vain several of his new schemes had worked out well his subordinates were of one mind with him trade was flourishing he felt he could afford a little spin jimsy's radiating fancies focused themselves at last on the vision of a trig little sailboat a jug of wine a loaf of bread in the cabin with possibly the book of verses underneath the bow or more suitably in the shadow of the sail and aleck van camp and himself astir in the rigging or plunging together from the gunwale for an early swim and before i get off i'll hear a singer that can sing he declared he telegraphed aleck who was by this time running down the eyelid of the squid to meet him at his club in new york then he made short work with the family experience had taught him that an attack from ambush was most successful look here edith this was at the breakfast table the very morning of his departure edith was sixteen the tallest girl in the academy almost ready for college and reckoned quite a queen in her world you be good and do my chores for me while i am away and i'll bring you home a do take good care of mother's bronchitis and keep the house straight i'm going on a cruise all right jim edith could always be counted on to catch the ball go ahead and have a bully time and don't drown yourself i'll drive the team straight to water mother and dad and the whole outfit trust me considering the occasion and the correctness of the sentiments jim forbore for once from making the daily suggestion that she chasten her language by the time the family appeared jim had laid out a rigid course of action for miss edith who rose to the occasion like a soldier mother'll miss you of course but jack and harold two of edith's admirers jack and harold can come around every day stout arm to lean upon that sort of thing you know mother can't be a bit jolly without plenty of men about and since sue became engaged she really doesn't count the boys will think they are running things of course but they'll see my iron hand in the velvet glove you can throw a blue chip on that jimsy and don't kiss me jim for dorothy snell and i vowed when we wished each other's rings on oh well brothers don't count 
and so amid the farewells of a tender protesting family he got off leaving edith in the midst of one of her monologues there was a telegram in new york saying that aleck van camp would join him in three days at the latest hamilton disliked the club and left it although his first intention had been to put up there he picked out a modest uptown hotel new to him for no other reason than that it had a pretty name the la rue then he began to consider details the day after his arrival was occupied in making arrangements for his boat he put into this matter the same painstaking buoyancy that he had put into a dull business for twelve years he changed his plans half a dozen times and exceeded them wholly in the size and equipment of the little vessel and in the consequent expense but he justified himself as men will by a dozen good reasons the trick little sailboat turned out to be a respectable yacht steam at that she was called the seagull neat in the beam stench in the bows rigged for coasting and provided with a decent living outfit she was good enough for any gentleman in the opinion of the agent who rented her jim was half ashamed at giving up the more robust scheme of sailing his own boat with aleck but some vague and expansive spirit moved him to see as he said what it would be like to go as far and as fast as we please while they were about it they would call on some cousins at bar harbor and get good fun out of it the idea of his holiday grew as he played with it as his spin took on a more complicated character his zest rose he went forth on sunday feeling as if some vital change was impending his little cruise loomed up large important epical he laughed at himself and thought with his customary optimism that a vacation was worth waiting twelve years for if waiting endowed it with such a flavor jim knew that aleck would relish the spin too aleck's nature was that of a grind tempered with sportiness jim sat down sunday morning and wrote out the whole program for aleck's endorsement sent the letter by special delivery and went out to reconnoitre the era of sunday orchestral concerts had begun but that day to jim's regret the singer was not a contralto dramatic soprano was on the program a new name quite unknown to jim his interest in the soloist waned but the orchestra was enough he thanked heaven that he was past the primitive stage of thinking any single voice more interesting than the assemblage of instruments known as orchestra hambleton found a place in the dim vastness of the hall and sank into his seat in a mood of vivid anticipation the instruments twanged the audience gathered and at last the music began its first effect was to rouse hamilton to a sharp attention to details the director the people in the orchestra the people in the boxes and then he settled down thinking his thoughts the past the future life and its meaning love and its power the long long thoughts of youth and ambition and desire came flocking to his brain the noble confluence of sound that is music worked upon him its immemorial miracle his heart softened his imagination glowed his spirit stirred time was lost to him and earth the orchestra ceased but hamilton did not heed the commotion about him the pause and the fresh beginning of the strings scarcely disturbed his ecstatic reverie a deep hush lay upon the vast assemblage broken only by the voices of the violins and then in the zone of silence that lay over the listening people silence that vibrated to the memory of the strings there rose a little song to hambleton sitting absorbed it was as if the circuit which galvanized him into life had suddenly been completed he sat up the singer's lips were slightly parted and her voice at first was no more than the half voice of a flute sweet gentle beguiling it was borne upward on the crest of the melody fuller and fuller as on a flooding tide free of my pain free of my burden of sorrow at last i shall see thee there was freedom in the voice and the sense of space of wind on the waters of life and the love of life jimsy was a soft-hearted fellow 
he never knew what happened to him but after uncounted minutes he seemed to be choking while the orchestra and the people in boxes and the singer herself swam in a hazy distance he shook himself called somebody he knew very well an idiot and laughed aloud in his joy but his laugh did not matter for it was drowned in the roar of applause that reached the roof jim did not applaud he went outdoors to think about it and after a time he found to his surprise that he could recall not only the song but the singer quite distinctly it was a tall womanly figure and a fair bright face framed abundantly with dark hair and the least little humorous twitch to her lips and her name was agatha redmond of course she can sing but it isn't like having the real thing tisn't an alto said jimsy ungratefully and just from habit the day's experience filled his thoughts and quieted his restlessness he awaited aleck with entire patience monday morning he spent in small necessary business affairs securing among other things several hundred dollars which he put in his money belt about the middle of the afternoon he left his hotel engaged a taxicab and started for riverside the late summer day was fine with the afternoon haze settling over a river in town he watched the procession of carriages the horseback riders the people afoot the children playing on the grass with a feeling of comradeship was he not also tasting freedom a lord of the earth his gaze travelled out to the river with the glimmer here and there of a tugboat a little steamer or the white sail of a pleasure craft the blood of some sea-going ancestor stirred in his veins and he thrilled at the thought of the days to come when his prow should be headed offshore the taxicab had its limitations and hamilton suddenly became impatient of its monotonous slithering along the firm road telling the driver to follow him he descended and crossed to where cathedral parkway switches off he walked briskly feeling the tonic of the sea air and circled the cathedral where workmen were lounging away after the day's toil the unfinished edifice loomed up like a giant skeleton of some prehistoric era and through its mighty open arches and buttresses jim saw fleecy clouds scudding across the western sky a stone saint muffled in burlap had just been swung up into his windy niche but had not yet discarded his robes of the world hamilton was regarding the shapeless figure with mild interest wondering which saint of the calendar could look so grotesque when a sound drew his attention sharply to earth it was a small sound but there was something strange about it it was startling as a flash in a summer day besides the workmen there was no living thing in sight on the hillside except his own taxicab swinging slowly into the avenue at that moment and a covered motor-car getting up speed a square away even as the car approached hamilton decided that the strange sound had proceeded from its ambushed tonneau and it was surely a human voice of distress he stepped forward to the curb the car was upon him then lumbered heavily and swiftly passed but on the instant of its passing there appeared beneath the lifted curtain and quite near his own face the face of the singer of yesterday and from pale agonized lips as if with dying breath she cried help help hamilton knew her instantly although the dark abundance of her hair was almost lost beneath hat and flowing veil and the bright humorous expression was blotted out by fear he stood for a moment rooted to the curb watching the dark mass of the car as it swayed down the hill then he beckoned sharply to his driver met the taxicab halfway and pointed to the disappearing machine quick can you overtake it i'd like nothing better than to run down one of them duke machines said the driver End of chapter two chapter three of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter three midsummer madness the driver of the taxicab proved to be a sound sport five minutes of luck aided by nerve brought the two machines somewhat nearer together 
the motor car gained in the open spaces the taxicab caught up when it came to weaving its way in and out and dodging the trolleys at the frequent moments when he appeared to be losing the car hamilton reflected that he had its number which might lead to something at the waldorf the car slowed up and the cab came within a few yards hamilton made up his mind at that instant that he had been mistaken in his supposition of trouble threatening the lady and looked momently to see her step from the car into the custody of those starched and lacquered menials who guard the portals of fashionable hotels but it was not so a signal was interchanged between the occupants of the car and some watcher in the doorway and the car sped on hamilton watching steadily wondered if she is being kidnapped why doesn't she make somebody hear plenty of chance they couldn't have killed her that isn't done and yet his heart smote him as he remembered the terror and distress written on that countenance and the cry for help something was the matter memory insisted there they go west west tenth alexander street tenth avenue the car lumbered on the cab half a block often more in the rear through endless regions of small shops and offices huddled together above narrow sidewalks through narrow and winding streets paved with cobblestones and jammed with cars and trucks squeezing past curbs where dirty children sat playing within a few inches of death-dealing wheels hamilton wondered what kept them from being killed by hundreds daily but the wonder was immediately forgotten in a new subject for thought the cab had stopped although several yards of clear road lay ahead of it the driver was climbing down the motor car was nosing its way along nearly a block ahead hamilton leapt out of course we've broken down he mildly inquired deep in his heart he was superstitiously thinking that he would let fate determine his next move if there were obstacles in the way of his further quest well and good he would follow the face no longer if you'll wait just a minute the driver was saying until i get my kit out but hamilton looking ahead saw that the car had disappeared and his mind suddenly veered not this time he announced here the meter says four twenty you take this i'm off he put a five-dollar bill into the hand of the driver and started on an easy run toward the west he had caught sight of smokestacks and masts in the near distance telling him that the motor car had almost if not quite reached the river such a vehicle could not disappear and leave no trace it ought to be easy to find ahead of him flaring lights alternated with the steady piercing brilliance of the incandescence and both struggled against the lingering daylight a heavy policeman at the corner had seen the car he pointed west into the cavernous darkness of the wharves if she ain't down at the imperial docks she's gone plump into the river for that's the way she went he insisted the policeman had the bearing of a major general and the accent of the city of cork hamilton went on past the curving streetcar tracks dodged a loaded dray emerging from the dock and threaded his way under the shed he passed piles of trunks and a couple of truckmen dumping assorted freight from an ocean liner no motor car or veiled lady nor sound of anything like a woman's voice hamilton came out into the street again looked about for another probable avenue of escape for the car and was at the point of bafflement when the major general pounded slowly along his way in there my son and no place either pointing to a smaller entrance alongside the imperial docks almost concealed by swinging signs it was plainly a forbidden way and at first sight appeared too narrow for the passage of any vehicle whatsoever but examination showed that it was not too narrow moreover it opened on a level with the street if you really want her she's in there though what'll be to pay if you go in there without a permit i don't know i'd hate to have to arrest you it might be the best thing for me if you did but i'm going in you might wait here a minute captain if you will i will that 
more especially as that car was a stunner for speed and i already had my eye on her i'd like to see you fish her out of that hole but hambleton was out of earshot and out of sight an empty passage smelling of bilge water and pent-up gases opened suddenly on to the larger dock damp flooring with wide cracks stretched out to the left on the right the solid planking terminated suddenly in huge piles against which the water capped with scum and weeds splashed fitfully the river bank lined with docks seemed lulled into temporary quietness ferry boats steamed at their labors farther up and down the river but the currents of travel left here and there a peaceful quarter such as this hamilton's gaze searched the dock and the river in rapid survey the dock itself was dim and vast with a few workmen looking like ants in the distance it offered nothing of encouragement but on the river fifty yards away and getting farther away every minute was a yacht's tender the figures of the two rowers were quite distinct their oars making rhythmical flashes over the water but it was impossible to say exactly what freight human or otherwise it carried it was evident that there were people aboard possibly several even as hamilton strained his eyes to see the outlines of the rowboat merged into the dimness it was pointed like a gun toward a large yacht lying at anchor farther out in the stream the vessel swayed prettily to the current and slowly swung its dim light from the masthead they've got her out in that boat said hamilton to himself feeling while the words were on his lips that he was drawing conclusions unwarranted by the evidence thus he stood one foot on the slippery log siding of the dock watching while the little drama played itself out so far as his present knowledge could go his judgment still hung in suspense but his senses quickened themselves to detect if possible what the outcome might be he saw the tender approach the boat lie alongside saw one sailor after another descend the rope ladder saw a limp inert mass lifted from the rowboat and carried up as if it had been merchandise to the deck of the yacht saw two men follow the limp bundle over the gunwale and finally saw the boat herself drawn up and placed in her davits hamelin's mind at last slid to its conclusion like a bolt into its socket they're kidnapping her without a doubt he said slowly for a moment he was like one struck stupid slowly he turned to the dock looking up and down its orderly but unprepossessing clutter dim lights shone here and there and a few hands were at work at the farther end the dull silence the unresponsive preoccupation of whatever life was in sight made it all seem as remote from him and from this tragedy as from the stars in fact it was impersonal and remote to such a degree that hamilton's practical mind halted yet an instant in doubt whether there were not some plausible explanation the thought came back to him suddenly that the motor-car must be somewhere in the neighborhood if his conclusion were correct on the instant his brain became active again it did not take long as a matter of fact to find the car though when he stumbled on it turned about and neatly stowed away close beside the partitioning wall he gave a start it was such a tangible evidence of what had threatened to grow vague and unreal on his hands he squeezed himself into the narrow space between it and the wall finally thrusting his head under the curtains of the tonneau it was high and dry empty as last year's cockle shell not a sign of life not a loose object of any kind except a filmy thing which hamilton found himself observing thoughtfully at last he picked it up a long mist-like veil he spread it out held it gingerly between a thumb and finger of each hand and continued to look at it abstractedly part of it was clean and whole dainty as only a bit of woman's finery can be 
but one end of it was torn and twisted and stretched out of all semblance to itself moreover it was dirty as if it had been ground under a muddy heel it was in its way a shrieking evidence of violence of unrighteous struggle hamilton folded the scarf carefully with its edges together and put it in his pocket jimmy's actions from this time on had an incentive and a spirit that had before been lacking he noted again the number of the car and returned to the edge of the dock to observe the yacht she had steamed up river a little way for some reason known only to herself and was now turning very slowly she was but faintly lighted and would pass for some pleasure craft just coming home but jim knew better he could at last put two and two together he would follow the face indeed he could not help following it in him had begun that divine experience of youth of youth essentially whether it come in early years or late of being carried off his feet by a spirit not himself he ran like a young athlete down the dock to the nearest workman evolving schemes as he went the dockhand apathetically trundled a small keg from one pile of freight to another wiped his hands on his trousers took a dry pipe out of his pocket and looked vacantly up the river before he replied to hamilton's question queer name jane dark they call her it was like pulling teeth to get information out of him but jim applied the forceps the yacht had been lying out in the river for two weeks or more possibly less belonged to foreign parts no one thereabouts knew who its owner was nor its captain nor its purpose in the harbor of new york at last quite gratuitously the man volunteered a personal opinion slippery boat in a gale wouldn't trust her hamilton walked smartly back taking a look both at the yacht and the motor-car as he went the yacht's nose pointed toward the jersey shore the car was creeping out of the dock as he overtook the machine he saw that it was in the hands of a mechanic in overalls and jumper in answer to hamilton's question as to the owner of the car the mechanic told him pleasantly to go to the devil and for once the sight of a coin failed to produce any perceptible effect but the major-general waiting half a block away was still in the humor of giving fatherly advice he welcomed jim heartily that's a hole i ain't got no use for how'd you make out well enough for all present purposes can you undertake to do a job for me if it ain't nothing i'd have to arrest you for i might consider it he chuckled i want you to go to the laramie club and tell alec van camp got the name that hamilton has gone off on the jean d'arc and may not be back for some time and he is to look after the seagull hold on young man you're not going to do anything out of reason as one might say oh no not at all most reasonable thing in the world you take this money and be sure to get the message to mr van camp will you all right now tell me where i can find a tugboat or a steam launch quick o'leary down at pier x two o has launches and everything else all right my son alec van camp at the laramie but you'll be good and don't drown yourself the last injunction word for word in the manner of the pert edith touched jimmy's humour he laughed ringingly his spirit was like a chime of bells on a weekday the hour which followed was one that james hamilton found it difficult to recall afterward with any degree of coherence but at the time his movements were mathematically accurate swift effective he got aboard a little steam tug and followed the yacht down the river and into the harbor as she stood out into the roads and began to increase her speed he directed the captain of the tug to steam forward and make as if to cross her bows this would make the pilot of the yacht angry but he would be forced to slow down a trifle jim watched long enough to see the success of his manoeuvre then went down into the cuddy which served as a cabin took off most of his clothes 
and looked to the fastenings of his money belt and then he watched his chance and when the tug was pretty nearly in the path of the yacht he crept to the stern and dropped overboard End of chapter three chapter four of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter four mr van camp makes a call alec van camp turned from the clerk's desk rather relieved to find that hamilton had not yet made his appearance alec had an errand on his mind and he reflected that jim was apt to be impetuous and reluctant to await another man's convenience at least jim wouldn't perceive that another man's convenience needed to be waited for and alec had no mind to announce this errand from the housetops it was not a business that pertained directly either to the seagull or to the coming cruise he made an uncommonly careful toilet discarding two neckties before the operation was finished when all was done the cravat presented a stuffed and warped appearance which was not at all satisfying even to alec's uncritical eye but the tie was the last of his supply and was perhaps slightly better than none at all dinner at the club was usually a dull affair and to mr van camp on this monday night it seemed more stupid than ever the club had been organized in the spirit of english clubs with the unwritten by-law of absolute and inviolable privacy for the individual no wild or woolly manners ever entered those decorous precincts no slapping on the shoulder no hail fellow greetings no chance dinner companionship ever dispelled the awful penumbra of privacy that surrounded even the humblest member a man's eating and drinking his coming or going his living or dying were matters only for club statistics not for personal inquiry or notice the result of this habitual attitude on the part of the members of the club and its servants was an atmosphere in which a cataleptic fit would scarcely warrant unofficial interference much less would merely mawkish or absent-minded behavior attract attention that was the function of the club to provide sanctuary for personal whims and idiosyncrasies of course always within the boundaries of the code on the evening in question mr van camp did not actually become silly but his manner lacked the poise and seriousness which sophisticated men are wont to bring to the important event of the day he was as near being nervous as a scotch-american van camp could be and at the same time he felt an unwonted flow of life and warmth in his cool veins he went so far as to make a remark to the waiter which he meant for an affable joke and then wanted to kick the fellow for taking it so solemnly you mind yourself george or they'll make you abbot of this monastery yet said alec as george helped him on with his evening coat yes sir thank you sir said george he left word at the office that in case any one called he was to be informed that mr van camp would return to the club for the night then in his silk hat and generally shining togs he set forth to make a call he was no stranger to new york and usually he took his cities as they came with a matter-of-fact nonchalance he would be as much home on his second day in london as he had ever been in lynn or he would go from a friend's weekend house-party where the habits of a sybarite were forced on him to a camp in the woods and pilot-bred fare with an equal smoothness of temper and enjoyment since luxury made no impression on him and hardship never blunted his own ideals of politeness or pleasure no one ever knew which life he preferred choosing to walk the fifteen or twenty squares to archangel apartment house his destination van camp looked about him on this night of his arrival with slightly quickened perceptions he cast a mildly appreciative eye toward the picture disclosed here and there by the glancing lights 
the chiaroscuro of the intersecting streets the constantly changing vistas for an unimpressionable man he was rather wrought upon nevertheless he entered the charming apartment whither he was bound with the detached and composed manner which society regards as becoming a maid with a foreign accent greeted him yes mademoiselle Rainier was at home mr van camp would find her in the drawing-room the stiff and unrelaxed manner with which mr van camp bowed to miss Rainier a moment later was not at all indicative of the fairly respectable fever within his scotch breast miss Rainier herself was pretty enough to cause quickened pulses she was of noble height evidently a woman of the world she gave mr van camp her hand in a greeting mingled of european daintiness and american frankness her vitality and abounding interest in life were manifest ah but you are very late this is how you become smart all at once in your new york atmosphere but pray be seated and here are cigarettes if you will no very well but tell me has that amorphous gill slit oh no the branchial lamella has it behaved itself and proved to be the avenue which which shall lead you to fame mr van camp stood silent through this flippant badinage and calmly waited until miss rainier had settled herself then he thoughtfully turned the chair offered him so as to command a slightly better view of the corner where she sat leaning against the old rose cushions finally taking his own time he touched off her greeting with his precise drawl i'm not smart as you call it even in new york though i try to be his eyes twinkled and his teeth gleamed his wide smile if i were smart i'd pass by your error in scientific nomenclature but really i ought not to do it if one cannot be exact that's just what i say if one cannot be exact why talk at all miss rainier caught it up with high glee she had a foreign accent and an occasional twist of words which proved her to be neither american nor englishwoman that's my principle she insisted leave other in undisturbed possession of their hobbies especially in conversation and don't say anything if you can't say what you mean but then you won't talk about your hobby and if i have no one to inform me how can i be exact but i'm the meekest person alive i am so ready to learn mr van camp surveyed first the bantering alluring eyes then turned his gaze upon the soft luxuries about them are you ready to turn this bijou dream into a laboratory smelling of alcohol and fish are you ready to spend hours wading in mud banks after specimens or searching in the sand under the broiling sun science does not consult comfort miss rainier's expression of quizzical teasing changed to one of rather thoughtful inquiry as if she were estimating the man behind the scientist van camp was of the lean angular type like jim hambleton he was also very manly and wholesome but even in his conventional evening clothes there was something about him that was unconventional a protesting untamed element of character that resisted all rules except those prescribed by itself he puzzled her now as he had often puzzled her before but if she made fun of his hobbies she had no mind to make fun of the man himself a cheerful intelligent smile finally ended her contemplating moment oh no no digging in the sun for me i'll take what science i get in another way put up in pre-digested packages or bottled anyway but the fishy way but please don't give me up you shed a good deal of light on my mental darkness last winter in egypt and maybe i can improve still more she suddenly turned with friendly confidential manner toward alec not waiting for replies to her remarks it's good to see you again and i like it here better than in egypt don't you don't you think this apartment jolly 
the shaded lamps made a pretty light over miss reynier's cream-coloured silk flounces over the delicate lace on her waist over her glossy dark hair and spirited face as aleck contemplated that face with its eager yet modest and womanly gaze and the noble outline of her figure he thought with an unwonted flowering of imagination that she was not unlike the diana of classic days a domestic diana he added in his mind she may love the woods and freedom but she will always return to the heart aloud he said if you will permit me miss rainier i would like to inform you at once of the immediate object of my visit here you must be well aware at this point mr van camp who true to his nature was looking squarely in the face of his companion of necessity allowed himself to be interrupted by miss rainier's lifted hand she was looking beyond her visitor through the drawing-room door mr chamberlain and mr lloyd jones announced the servant as miss rainier swept forward with outstretched hand to greet the newcomers van camp fixed his eyes on his hostess with a mingled expression of masculine rage and submission whether he thought her too cordial toward the other men or too cool toward himself was not apparent presently he too was shaking hands with the visitors who were evidently old friends of the house madame Prenier, the aunt of mademoiselle was summoned and van camp was marooned on a sofa with lloyd jones who was just in from the west aleck found himself listening to an interminable talk about copper veins and silver veins a new kind of assaying instrument and the good luck attendant upon the opening of lloyd jones new mine the liza lou aleck was the essence of courtesy to everything except sham and was able to indicate a mild interest in mr lloyd jones mining affairs it was sufficient lloyd jones turned sidewise on his end of the sofa spread out plump gesticulating hands and poured upon him an eloquent torrent of fact speculation and high-spirited enthusiasm concerning idaho in general and the future of the liza lou in particular more than that by and by his cheerful half-impudent manner threatened to turn poetic it's great living in the open out there he went on by this time including the whole company in his exordium you ride or tramp or dig rock all day and at night you lie down under the clear stars thankful for your blanket and your rock bed and your campfire and more than thankful if there's a bit of running water nearby it's a great life miss rainier listened to him with eyes that were alternately puzzled and appreciative it was a discourse that would have seemed to her much more natural coming from aleck van camp but then mr van camp really did the thing that sort of thing and he rarely talked about it it had probably been mr lloyd jones first essay in the world out of reach of his valet and a club cocktail and he was consequently impressed with his achievement it was evident that miss rainier and the amateur miner were on friendly terms though aleck had not seen or heard of him before he had hobnobbed with mr chamberlain in london and on more than one scientific jaunt the slightest flicker of jealous resentment gleamed in aleck's eyes but his speech was as slow and precise as ever i was just trying to convince miss rainier that outdoor life has its peculiar joys he said i was even now suggesting that she should dig though not for silver does mr lloyd jones lucre seem more alluring than my little wriggly beast miss rainier if aleck meant the speech for a trap to force the young woman to indicate a preference the trick failed as it deserved to fail miss rainier was able to play a waiting game i couldn't endure either your minds or your mud puddles you are both absurd and i don't understand how you ever get recruits for your hobbies but come over and see this new engraving mr jones it's an old-fashioned picture of your beloved rhine aleck thus liberated from mr lloyd jones and his minds 
made his way across the room to madame reynier the cunning of old adam was in his eye but otherwise he was the picture of deferential innocence madame reynier liked aleck with his inoffensive americanisms and unfailing kindliness and with her friends she was frankness itself with two men on miss reynier's hands for entertainment it seemed to aleck unlikely that either one could make any alarming progress besides he was glad of a tete-a-tete -tete with the chaperone madame reynier was a tall straight woman elderly dressed entirely in black with gaunt aristocratic features and great directness of speech she had the fine kind of hauteur that forbids persons of this type ever to speak of money of disease of scandal or of too intimate personalities in madame reynier's case it also restrained her from every sort of exaggerated speech she spoke english with some difficulty and preferred french van camp seated himself on a spindle-legged gilt chair by madame reynier's side and begged to know how they were enduring the new york climate which had formerly proved intolerable to madame reynier as he seated himself she stretched out saving hands i can endure the climate thank you but i can't endure to see your life endangered on that silly chair my dear mr van camp there thank you and when he was seated in a solid mahogany he was rewarded with madame reynier's confidential chat they had returned to their new york apartment in the midst of the summer season she said for professional advice she and her niece liked the city and never minded the heat melanie her aunt explained had been enabled to see several old friends and for her own part she liked home at any time of the year better than the most comfortable of hotels this is quite like home she added even though we are really exiles aleck ventured to hope that the professional advice had not meant serious trouble of any sort a slight indisposition only and are you much better now aleck inquired solicitously oh it wasn't i it was melanie madame smiled i became my own physician many years ago and now i never see a doctor except when we ask one to dine but youth has no such advantage madame fairly beamed with benevolence while explaining one of her pet idiosyncrasies before aleck could make any headway in gleaning information concerning her own and melanie's movements as he was shamelessly trying to do lloyd jones had persuaded miss rayner to sing some of those quaint old things please he was saying and aleck wondered if he never would hang himself with his own rope but lloyd jones cheerful voice went on some of those hungarian things are jolly and funny even though you can't understand the words makes you want to dance or sing yourself aleck groaned but melanie began to sing with jones hovering around the piano by the time melanie had sung everybody's favorites excluding aleck's mr chamberlain rose to depart he was an englishman a serious heavy gentleman very loyal to old friends and very slow in making new ones he made an engagement to dine with aleck on the following evening and as he went out threw back to the remaining gentleman an offer of seats in his machine i ought to go said jones but if van camp will stay i will that is he added with belated punctiliousness if the ladies will permit thank you chamberlain i'm walking drawled aleck then turning to the company with his cheerful grin he stated quite impersonally i was thinking of staying long enough to put one question um, a matter of some little importance to miss rainier when she gives me the desired information i shall go me too chirped mr lloyd jones i came expressly to talk over that plan of building up friendly adjoining estates out in idaho sort of a private shooting and hunting park you know and i haven't had a minute to say a word jones suddenly began to feel himself aggrieved as the door closed after chamberlain melanie motioned them back to their seats 
it's not so very late she said easily come back and make yourselves comfortable and i'll listen to both of you she said with a demure little devil in her eye i haven't seen you for ages and i don't know when the good moment will come again she included the two men in a friendly smile waved a hand toward the waiting chairs and adjusted a light shawl over the shoulders of madame reynier but aleck by this time had the bit in his teeth and would not be coaxed his ordinarily cool eye rested wrathfully on the broad shoulders of mr lloyd jones who was lighting a cigarette and he turned abruptly to miss rainier his voice was as serious as if parliament at least had been hanging on his words may i call to-morrow miss rainier at about twelve oh i say put in jones all of you come to luncheon with me at the little gray fox will you capital place and all sorts of nice people do come about one van camp could have slain him i think my proposition a prior one he remarked with dogged precision but of course miss rainier must decide he recovered his temper enough to add quite pleasantly considering the circumstances unless madame rainier will take my part turning to the older woman oh no not fair shouted jones madame rainier is always on my side aren't you madame madame rainier smiled inscrutably i am always on the side of virtue in distress she said that's me then isn't it the way you're abusing me mademoiselle listening here to van camp all the evening but melanie tired perhaps of being patiently tactful settled the matter i can't go to luncheon with anybody to-morrow she protested i've had a touch of that arch enemy indigestion you see and i can't do anything but my prescribed exercises nor drink anything but distilled water nor eat anything but food we know cried the irrepressible jones but the little gray fox has a special diet for just such cases as yours do come heavens then i don't want to go there groaned aleck melanie gave jones her hand half in thanks and half in farewell no thank you not to-morrow but sometime soon perhaps thursday will that do she smiled then as jones was discontentedly lounging about the door she did a pretty thing turning from the door she stood with face averted from everybody except van camp and for an instant her eyes met his in a friendly half-humorous but wholly non-committal glance his eyes held hers in a look that was like an embrace i will see you soon she said quietly van camp said good-night to jones at the corner after they had walked together in silence for half a block good-night van camp said jones then he added cordially by the way i'm going back next week in my private car to watch the opening of the liza lou and i'd be mighty glad if you'd go along anything else to do thanks extremely but i'm going on a cruise as out entered the piously exclusive hall of the club his good nature came to his aid he wondered whether he hadn't scored something after all End of chapter four Chapter Five of *The Stolen Singer* by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Five: Melanie's Dreams. Midnight in the relaxation of slumber could subtract nothing from the high-brow dignity of the club officials, and the message that was waiting for Mister Van Camp was delivered in the most correct manner mr hambleton sends word to mr van camp that he has gone away on the jeanne d'arc mr hambleton may not be back for some time and requests mr van camp to look after the seagull very well thank you replied aleck rather absent-mindedly he was unable to see immediately just what challenge in his own plan the sudden turn of jim's would cause and he was for the moment too deeply preoccupied with his own personal affairs to speculate much about it his thoughts went back to the events of the evening recalled the picture of his diana and her teasing ways 
and dwelt especially upon the honest friendly wholly bewitching look that had flown to him at the end of the evening absurd as his own attempt at a declaration had been he somehow felt that he himself was not absurd in melanie's eyes though he was far from certain whether she was inclined to marry him aleck on his part had not come to his decision suddenly or impulsively nor having arrived there was he to be turned from it easily true as it was that he sincerely and affectionately desired melanie reynier for a wife yet on the whole he was a very cool romeo he was manly but he was calculating he was honorably disposed toward matrimony but he was not reborn with love and so in the sober bedroom of the club he quickly fell into the good sleep induced by fatigue and healthy nerves morning brought counsel and a disposition to renew operations a note was dispatched to his diana by a private messenger and the boy was bidden to wait for an answer it came presently come at twelve if you wish melanie Rainier. aleck smiled with satisfaction here was a wise venture going through happily he hoped he was pleased that she had named the very hour he had asked for the night before that was like her good frank way of meeting a situation and it augured well for the unknown emergencies of their future life he had little patience with timidity and traditional coyness in women and great admiration for an open and fearless spirit melanie's note almost set his heart thumping but not quite and no one understood the cool nature of that organ better than melanie herself the ladies in the apartment at the archangel had lingered at the breakfast the austerity of which had been mitigated by a centre decoration of orchids and fern fresh touched with dew or so madame reynier had described them to melanie as she brought them to her with the card of mr lloyd jones miss reynier smiled faintly admired the blossoms and turned away the ladies usually spoke french with each other though occasionally madame reynier dropped into the harsher speech of her native country on this morning she did this telling melanie for the tenth time in as many days that in her opinion they ought to be going home madame considered this her duty and felt no real responsibility after the statement was made nevertheless she was glad to find melanie disposed to discuss the matter a little further do you wish to go home auntie or is it that you think i ought to go i don't wish to go without you child you know that and i am very comfortable here but his highness your cousin is very impatient i see that in every letter from krovetz you offended him deeply by putting off your marriage to count lorenzo and every day now deepens his indignation against you i don't like to discuss these things melanie but i suspect that your action deprives him of a very necessary revenue and i understand better than you do to what lengths your cousin is capable of going when he is displeased you are by the law of your country his ward until you marry would it not be better to submit to him in friendship rather than to incur his enmity after all he is your next of kin the head of your family and a very powerful man if we are going home at all we ought to go now but suppose we should decide not to go home at all you will have to go some time dear child you are all alone except for me and in the nature of things you can't have me always now that you are young you think it an easy thing to break away from the ties of blood and birth but believe me it isn't easy you with your nature could never do it the call of the land is strong and the time will come when you will long to go home long to go back to the land where your father led his soldiers and where your mother was admired and loved madame reynier paused and watched her niece who with eyes cast down was toying with her spoon suddenly a crimson flush rose and spread over melanie's cheeks and forehead and neck and when she looked up into madame reynier's face she was gazing through unshed tears she rose quickly came round to the older woman's chair and kissed her cheek affectionately dear auntie you are very good to me and patient too 
it's all true i suppose but the prospect of home and count lorenzo together ah well she smiled reassuringly and again caressed madame reynier's gaunt old face i'll think it all over auntie dear madame reynier followed melanie into her sitting-room bringing the precious orchids in her two hands fearful lest the fragile vase should fall melanie regarded them a moment and then said she thought they would do better in the drawing-room i sometimes think the little garden pink quite as pretty as an orchid they aren't so much in mr lloyd john's style as these replied madame reynier she had a faculty of commenting pleasantly without the least hint of criticism this remark delighted melanie no i should never picture mr lloyd jones as a garden pink but then auntie you remember how eloquent he was about the hills and the stars that speech did not at all indicate a hot-house nature nevertheless i think his sentiments have been cultivated like his orchids not a bad achievement said melanie there was an interval of silence while the younger woman stood looking out of the window and madame reynier cut the leaves of a french journal she did not read however and presently she broke the silence i don't remember that mr van camp ever sent orchids to you mr van camp never gave me any kind of flower he thinks flowers are the most intimate of all gifts and should only be exchanged between sweethearts at least i heard him expound some such theory years ago when we first knew him madame smiled a significant smile if any one had been looking nothing further was said until melanie unexpectedly shot straight to the mark with how do you think he would do auntie in place of count lorenzo madame reynier showed no surprise he is a sterling man but your cousin would never consent to it and if i should not consult my cousin my dear melanie that would entail many embarrassing consequences and embarrassments are worse than crimes melanie could laugh at that and did i've already answered a note from mr van camp this morning auntie no don't worry she playfully answered a sudden anxious look that came upon her aunt's countenance i've not said yes to him but he's coming to see me at twelve if i don't give him a chance to say what he has to say he'll take one anywhere he's capable of proposing on the street cars besides i have something also to say to him well my dear you know best certainly i think you know best was madame reynier's last word mr van camp arrived on the stroke of twelve an expression of happiness on his lean quizzical face i'm supposing to be starting on a cruise he told melanie but luck is with me my cousin hasn't turned up or rather he turned up only to disappear instantly otherwise he would have dragged me off to catch the first ebb tide with me hanging back like an anchor chain is your cousin then such a tyrant oh yes he's a masterful man is jimmy and how did he disappear instantly it sounds mysterious it is mysterious but jim can take care of himself at least i hope he can the message said he had sailed on the jeanne d'arc whatever that is and that i was to look after our hired yacht the seagull melanie looked up startled the jeanne d'arc was it she cried are you sure but of course there must be many boats by that name are there not but did he say nothing more where he was going and why he changed his plans no not a word more than that why do you know of a boat named the jeanne d'arc yes very well but it cannot matter it must be another vessel surely meanwhile what are you going to do without your companion aleck rose from the slender gilt chair where as usual he had perched himself walked to the window and thrust his hands into his pockets for a contemplative moment then he turned and came to a stand squarely before melanie looking down on her with his quizzical honest eyes that depends melanie he said slowly upon whether you are going to marry me or not for a second or two melanie's eyes refused to lift but aleck's firm planted figure 
his steady gaze above all his dominating will forced her to look up there he was smiling strong big kindly melanie started to smile but for the second time that morning her eyes unexpectedly filled with tears i can't talk to you towering over me like that she said at last softly her smile winning against the tears aleck did not move i don't want you to talk to me about it all i want is for you to say yes but i'm not going to say yes at least i don't think i am do sit down aleck started straight for the gilt chair oh no not that you are four times too big for that chair besides it's quite valuable it's a louis cans aleck indulged in a vicious kick at the ridiculous thing picked up an enormous leather-bottomed chair made apparently of lead and placed it jauntily almost beside miss rainier's chair but facing the other way this is much better thank you he said now tell me why you think you are not going to say yes to me melanie's mood of softness had not left her but sitting there face to face with this man face to face with his seriousness his masculine will and strength she felt that she had something yet to struggle for some deep personal right to be acknowledged it was with a dignity an aloofness that was quite real yet very sweet that she met this american lover he had her hand in his firm grasp but he was waiting for her to speak he was giving her the hearing that was in his opinion her right in the first place melanie began you ought to know more about me who i am and all that sort of thing i am in one sense not at all what i seem to be and that in the case of marriage is a dangerous thing it is an important thing at least but i do know who you are i knew long ago since you never referred to the matter of course i never did you are the princess auguste stephanie of krovetz cousin of the present duke stephen called king of krovetz you are even in line for the throne though there are two or three lives between you have incurred the displeasure of duke stephen and are practically an exile from your country a voluntary exile melanie corrected voluntary only in the sense that you prefer exile to absolute submission to the duke there is no alternative if you return melanie was silent aleck lifted the hand which he held touched it gently with his lips and laid it back beside his fellow on melanie's lap then he rose and lifted both hands before her half in fun and half in earnestness as if he were a courtier doing reverence to his queen see your highness how ready i am to do you homage only smile on the most devoted of your servants melanie could not resist his gentle gaiety it was as if they were two children playing at a story aleck in such a mood as this was as much fun as a dancing bear and in five minutes more he had won peals of laughter from melanie it was what he wanted to brighten her spirits so presently he came back to that big chair though he did not again take her hand i knew you were titled and important melanie and at first i thought that sealed my case entirely but you seem to forget your state seem not to care so very much about it and perhaps that made me think it was possible for us both to forget it or at least to ignore it i haven't a gold throne to give you but you're the only woman i've ever wanted to marry and i wasn't going to give up the chance until you said so do you know also that if i marry out of my rank and without the consent of duke stephen i shall forfeit all my fortune cut off without a cent aleck laughed but presently paused embarrassed for the first time since he had begun his plea i you know haven't millions but there's a decent income even for two and then i can always go to work and earn something he smiled at her giving information to a thirsty world about the gill slit as you call it it would be fun earning money for you i'd like to do it melanie smiled back at him but left her chair and wandered uneasily about the room as if turning a difficult matter over in her mind aleck stood by watching 
presently she returned to her chair pushed him gently back into his seat and dropped down beside him before she spoke she touched her fingers lightly almost lovingly along the blue veins of his big hand lying on the arm of the chair the hand turned like a magnet spring and imprisoned hers no dear friend not yet said Melanie, drawing away her hand yet not very quickly after all there is much to say to you and i have been wondering how to say it but i shall do it now like the heroes in the novels she smiled again i am going to tell you the story of my life good said aleck all ready for chapter one but your maid wants you at the door go away sophie said melanie serve luncheon to madame Renier alone i shall wait and you'll have to wait too poor man she looked scrutinizingly at aleck or are you perhaps hungry i'm not going to talk to a hungry man she announced not a bite till i've heard chapter thirty nine said aleck in a moment she became serious again i have lived in england and here in america she began long enough to understand that the differences between your people and mine are more than differences of language and climate they are ingrained in our habits of thought our education our judgments of life and of people my childhood and youth were wholly different from yours or from what an american girl's could be and yet i think i understand your american women though i suppose i am not in the least like them but i on the other hand have seen the dark side of life and particularly of marriage when i was a child i was more important in my own country than i am now since it seemed then that my father would succeed to the throne i was brought up to feel that i was not a woman but a pawn in the game of politics when i had been out of the convent for a year or more i loved a youth and was loved in return but our marriage was laughed at put aside declared impossible because he was of a rank inferior to my own my lover disappeared i know not where or how then affairs changed my father died and it transpired that i had been officially betrothed since childhood to duke stephen's brother the count lorenzo the duke was my guardian and there was no one else to whom i could appeal but the very week set for the wedding i faced the duke and declared i would never marry the count his highness raged and stormed but i told him a few things i knew about his brother and i made him see that i was in earnest the next day i left Krovitz, and the duke gave out that i was ill and had gone to a health resort that the wedding was postponed i went to france and hid myself with my aunt took one of my own middle names and her surname and have been known for some time as you know as melanie Rainier i know you wish to tell me all these things melanie but i do not want you to recall painful matters of the past now said aleck gently you shall tell me of them at another time the color brightened in melanie's face her eyes glowed no not another time you must understand now especially because all this preface leads me to what i really want to say to you it is this i do not now care for the man i loved at nineteen nor for any of the other men of my country who have been pleased to honour me with their regard but ever since those early days i have had a dream of a house a place different from duke stephen's house different from the homes of many people of my rank my dream has a husband in it who is a companion a friend my equal in love my superior in strength melanie's eyes lifted to meet aleck's and they were full of an almost tragic passion but it was a passion for comprehension and love not primarily for the man sitting before her she added simply and for my dream i give all the wealth all the love i have the room was very still aleck van camp sat quiet and grave his forehead resting on his hand he looked up finally and melanie who was beside him pale and quite worn poor child you needed me more than i thought was what he said but melanie had not quite finished 
no that is not enough that i should need you you must also need me want what i alone can give you match my love with yours and this i think you do not do you calculate you remain cool you plan your life like a campaign and i am part of your equipment you are a thousand times better than count lorenzo but i think your principles of reasoning are the same you do not love me enough and that is why i cannot say yes aleck had taken this last blow standing he walked slowly around and stood before melanie much as he had stood before her when he first asked her to marry him and this time as he looked down on her fairness there was infinite gentleness and patience and love in his eyes he bent over lifted melanie's two hands and drew her bodily out of her seat she was impassive her quick alertness her vitality her passionate seriousness had slipped away aleck put his arms around her very tenderly and kissed her lips not a lover's kiss exactly and yet nothing else then he looked into her face i shall not do this again melanie dear till you give me leave but i have no mind to let you go either you and madame reynier are going on a cruise with me will you get your maid to pack your grip it will be better for you than the professional advice which you came to new york for aleck stopped suddenly his practical sense coming to the surface heavens you haven't had any lunch and it's all times of the day he rang the bell begged the maid to fetch bread and butter and tea and to ask madame reynier to come to the drawing-room when she appeared he met her with a grave but in no wise a cowed spirit madame reynier your niece refuses for the present to consider herself engaged to me i however am unequivocally betrothed to her and i shall be endlessly grateful if you and miss reynier will be my guests on the seagull for as long a time as you find it diverting we shall cruise along the coast and put into harbor at night if it seems best and i'll try to make you comfortable will you come madame reynier was willing if melanie was and melanie had no strength if she had the will to combat aleck's masterful ways it was soon settled aleck swung off down the street rereading jim's letter intent only on the seagull and the preparations for his guests but at the back of his mind he was thinking poor girl she needs me more than i thought End of chapter five